Okay, before you uh, have, have your first guess, you have spent a whole bunch of money, and we all know that. Uh, you've spent money on licenses and permits. You've gotten a commissary, or you at least figured out where you're going to pick up water and dispose of your waste. You've bought gasoline. You've bought propane. You got your cell phone started so that you can uh, run your credit cards. You've bought your inventory. You got a whole bunch of food you're sitting on. And of course, you spent a whole bunch more money on insurance and, and a whole uh, bunch of other things. And the, the real question of this is when will you start making a profit? Because right now you're in the hole. You haven't even served one person and you are in the hole. But you got to know how much money it takes to dig yourself out of that hole. So with a little bit of math, you'll know exactly how much money you need to cover all your expenses. And what we're going to learn today is how to break that down into a daily amount. But we're going to be real specific on getting to that number. The uh, mathematical equation for this is called a break-even formula. You take the grand total of your fixed expenses. A fixed expense very rarely changes or never changes. Like your insurance premium only changes once a year. So if you're paying for it per month, you know each month how much your insurance is going to cost you. More than likely, your cell phone is going to be the same amount month after month after month. Propane and even your gasoline, to an extent, are going to be fixed cost. The reason I say that is because propane is figured at the, the full burn rate of your equipment. So when you start to plan how much propane you're going to need, you're assuming that it's going to be burning the full hour, full blast. And that's just not the case. Whatever cooking equipment you have will cycle on and off. But the BTU amount that you're given as if it runs the full hour. So even though your planning will be slightly higher for that fixed cost, you still know pretty much what you're going to be spending. And you definitely would not be going over. Same with gasoline. You know what your miles per, per gallon of your vehicle are. You know how far you're going to be traveling on average each day, each week. So you can get a really good um, ballpark number for your consumption on gasoline. You know how long your propane or your, um, I'm sorry, your gasoline powered generator will run. So you can plan those numbers. It's not a guess. You can plan it. And then that's going to be divided. Once you have that dollar amount figured out, you're going to divide it by 100% minus, again, minus your total variable percentages. A variable percentage is a dollar amount that changes as you sell something. For example, you open up this in uh, the morning, tomorrow morning, you have already consumed gasoline and you're going to burn propane. If you sell nothing the whole day, your food cost hasn't changed. You have not consumed any food. So it's a variable cost. And somebody comes in and buys a hamburger or a hot dog or a taco, then you're consuming the food in your business and that dollar amount goes up. The percentage of that dollar amount does not go up. So it's a variable percentage based on the consumption of your inventory or based on your sales. When you do that division, that gives you the break-even point in dollars. And you can do that for a year, a month, a week, or a day. We're going to start with a year, break it down to the day. Like I said, once we know that break-even point, we're going to break it down into a daily sales goal. And that sales goal is telling you, when I start up my truck and I pull out the driveway, I need to make this amount of money to pay for all the bills. And we're going to show how to pay for yourself in there, too. Okay, and of course, I have a spreadsheet for that. And there you're looking at the sum total of one page of that spreadsheet. And it's basically set up as an interview. And I know it looks like a lot because you're going, oh, there's like 30, 40, 50 questions there. It's not as bad as it seems. Absolutely not as bad as it seems. So we're going to look at the spreadsheet. This is set up like I do all of my spreadsheets. If it's in yellow, 
that is a number where you're going to input things. The sheet's intuitive in that every one of those cells has a little note that will come up to tell you what information needs to go into that cell so that you're not sitting there trying to guess at what you need. And we're going to go through one of these sheets here in just a minute, step by step. So let me switch over to Excel and we will look at the spreadsheet. All right, the very first thing there in black, it says the break-even interview. You're going to answer all the questions, give it the best estimate you've got, and clearly you don't want to estimate. You want to be as detailed as possible, but if you have to estimate something, then do so. All the information is going to go into the yellow blocks. And then in that big yellow block, it tells you, again, all the other cells contain mathematical formulas. And this will be consistent throughout each of the different pages on this spreadsheet. So we're going to start with the total days open, accounting for weather. In this example, the person that I talked to wants to be open three days a week, all 52 weeks of the year. So they're going to be open 156 days. I went ahead and left 156 because we're going to hope that they have good weather. But if you're going to be realistic, you might want to knock that number down to maybe, let's do 150. Because you're going to have some weekends where you just simply are not going to be able to work because of the weather. The next question it asks is the total number of months in your selling season. And you can see this is set up as a drop down. It will only let you put in the numbers 1 to 12. So in this case, he was going to close two months out of the year. When it's bad weather, soon as you be up in 10 months. The next question is, the average number of days is going to be open per, per week. As I mentioned, it's going to be open three days a week. So we're going to average three days a week. The uh, number of hours you're open for sales, and that does not include any prep or closing. This is when you open up and you're going to start taking orders to the moment when you shut down and stop taking orders. So this is your service time. He wants to be open three hours a day. Basically, he's running a lunch shift. So three days or three hours per day. The next question it asks now is the other part of your labor. How many hours are you going to be doing prep work and closing or cleanup work? Again, this has nothing to do with you shopping or any of those other tasks. This is related to the truck. Because what the spreadsheet's going to, to look at is uh, turning on your propane for a certain number of hours for service, but it also has to turn it on slightly ahead of those hours so everything can heat up. So the spreadsheet's going to figure out propane usage for you. The next question is your projected percentage of sales using a credit card. If you're brand new to the business, you have no clue how many people are going to, going to use a credit card versus how many people are going to use cash. Put a number in there. Doesn't matter. It will let you put um, from 1% to 100%. So you can actually say that I'm only, only going to take credit cards and it will do the computations on that. So in this example, we're doing 50-50, but we could change it to whatever number is either realistic or is actually shown through uh, historical data if you've been open any length of time at all. The average check for a credit card. Get on that cell so the little instructions move out of the way. The average ticket for the credit card, $18 in this case, but whatever yours is, you should have a goal of what you want every person to buy. It should be whatever your main product is, a side item and a drink. I mean, that makes a meal. And whatever those common things add up to, call that your average check until you actually know what you're going to get. Don't pick your most expensive thing because people aren't going to buy your most expensive thing 100% of the time. So clearly you couldn't have an average ticket of, uh, you know, $32 if your most expensive three things add up to $32. That will not happen. 
you might get lucky and have an average check of say 28 or 29 or 30 dollars because that is being offset by the people that don't buy the most expensive thing so be realistic most people kind of lump their prices together or group them together um, so it won't be too difficult for you to figure out what your goal should be. In this particular case, they want an $18 check average because they do sell some things that would create a $20 check. And they also sell some things that would create a $14 or $15 check. So a check average. The next thing is the processing fee. If you have a per uh, ticket processing fee. Square charges you 10 cents. So they're using Square, so we're putting in 10 cents. You could leave that blank if you don't have that. If you have your own merchant account and you're dealing with a company that charges you the uh, varying rates, depending on what credit card is being used or debit card, then you can put in what your average processing percentage is in the next area. Square is a 2.6%, so we're doing 2.6%. Okay, we're going to move on down to the fuel. We're going to talk about the tow vehicle. If you have a food truck, obviously you don't have a tow vehicle. You can put your food truck information there. You can choose gasoline or diesel. And then you put in the number of miles per gallon that your particular vehicle is going to get. Uh, and do that under weight. So if you have a truck that normally gets... 18 miles to the gallon, but then when you add your trailer to it, it suddenly drops down to 12. Don't put 18. Put when you are towing under weight and under, under the engine stress, so that way you get a realistic number there. Next number is the average daily miles driven. And you can figure that out. It's not that difficult. You know that you're going to get up and go to a store somewhere or go to the commissary uh, which you may or may not be bringing your vehicle with you, but you're going to be driving. You know what that mileage is going to be. You know how far it is to drive from the commissary to go set up. And then you know the round trip. So put that number in. If you don't know the number, get out and drive it. Because we want to be as good as we can possibly be on the numbers we can determine on our own. So the average miles driven. If you're going to be one of those folks that goes to state fairs and, and that type of thing, you can still give a good estimate of how far you're going to be driving. The next one is the cost of fuel uh, per gallon. Now, you notice I have $3.42 there. In the area where this person lives, the current price is $2.92. I always go up about $0.50 cents more because we're looking at a year. Uh, when we get into some of the other numbers. So we're thinking long-term in this. Prices are going to go up. They could also go down. But I'm going to assume they're going to go up. I want to make sure I have enough money accounted for for when it goes up. And there's no need to panic because at 392, we should have a couple of good months around the 392, 302, somewhere in that range. And then it'll probably start creeping up. So I don't have to worry about it hitting the you know three, 345, 350, 355, because I'll have had months where I didn't pay $3.42. Now, if it suddenly doubles because we have a couple of hurricanes and an oil platform explode, then you may want to readjust this number so you know what your new break-even point is. That's the neat thing about this sheet. Once it's filled out, you can make minor tweaks so you know how much money it costs you to Put that key in the ignition and pull that truck out of the, the driveway. Then you're going to do the exact same things for your generator. How long will, uh, or how many gallons rather, is your tank? How long will the generator run on a gallon? And if you don't know, it should be in your paperwork somewhere what they estimate it'll run. Put that number in until you get some historical data. And then you can come back and readjust it. The point is you try to make as educated of a guess as possible. Don't leave stuff blank just because you don't know. Same, same price on the gasoline. And you could make that a diesel if you have a diesel generator. Whatever you have, it will make those adjustments. Then we're going to talk about propane. 
each piece of equipment and each burner on each piece of equipment will have a BTU rating. It'll be somewhere in the paperwork on that piece of equipment or there'll be a plate somewhere on the piece of equipment that says how many BTUs it will use. Add up all the BTUs for every fryer, every grill, and any other piece of equipment that you have that will consume your propane. So if you have a propane generator, and put that information in there as well. Then put down the cost of propane and again add some additional money in there assuming it's going to go up. Propane will go up and down as the uh, weather changes especially in the northern part of the country and that affects the propane costs everywhere. Once you've done this for a couple of years you'll know when the peaks and valleys are and then be able to buy appropriately but I always add on again uh, about 50 cents just to make sure I'm covered on both sides of the current price. We're going to continue on. Now we're going to get into to actual numbers. Starting with all the permits and licenses. This particular person has a $35 a year business license they have to fill out. They have a $30 inspection fee for their fire permit once a year. Their uh, food license is $277. They don't live in a town where they are required to have a peddler permit. They don't plan on doing anything where they require a temporary permit. They're only going to be vending within their own area. Temporary permits work when you go into different states. Um, so if you plan on traveling to another state, you can get a temporary permit. So you want to assume that cost and put it in there. And then I've got lots of space, as you can see, for many other permits and any other kind of fees on the government side of things that you would have to go through to uh, get yourself licensed and open and operating. So plenty of room to put in stuff that I don't have listed. Insurance, starting with general liability, commercial auto, commercial property, income stabilization, is one where if you are going to be, do a lot of vending at events you can take out policies that will pay you if there's a certain level of uh, inclement weather at that location now there is a little caveat to that before you start looking this up on the internet the um, official weather where you are may not be what they measure. For example, if you're going to be vending at a uh, fairgrounds that's you know well outside the city limits, they may pick or may tell you when you're doing the, um, uh, the policy that their official weather station for that particular event is going to be two, three, four, five miles away, which could mean that the weather where the measurement system is will not be bad enough to pay out where you're where you are located so make sure you understand what those kind of insurances do and what those limitations are there's also other insurance you can get uh, too that's why i've got more spaces for insurance for people that are worried about their health insurance have your company pay for it you can put in however much it will be I know the last time I looked, it was about $780 a month. You can pop that in there if you wanted. Now we're going to move into fixed salaries. This will be if you pay a manager. This would be your pay for the owner. And then if you have your staff, if you pay them a set amount. And this again is in annual. Now you see that the, the uh, person here wants to be able to pay themselves a hundred thousand dollars a year and there's nothing wrong with that you can pay yourself whatever you want and that's what this sheet will do it tells you how much money you need to make per day in sales to be able to afford to pay yourself a hundred thousand dollars people are always asking at what point do you go full time you can do it one of two ways you can wait till you generate the sales or the profitability rather that covers your current salary or you can just say I'm going to make my current salary 
this is how much I need to do in sales and how much I need to do in profitability to do that. It depends on your experience level and how gutsy you are. This person wants to make $100,000 a year. So we're putting it in there. $100,000. And remember, this is not profit. This is just $100,000 in pay. All right, next thing we got is... Let me quit jumping around so much. Next thing we got is uh, professional services, legal accounting. If you do an advisory course, like for instance, the course that I offer, that becomes a, a expense. It's also a tax deduction because any training that you do is a tax deduction. So anybody that's unwilling to pay that little tiny bit of money there, $250, to get all the information that I give plus eight hours with me, it's just annoying. It's already going to be tax-free, tax-deductible rather. So please, spend the money, get yourself the education you need, and let's make you profitable so you can make that $100,000. And not have to be one of the people that's, that uh, will say, I've been open three years and haven't paid myself yet. When I see those, I just, just cringe. Because you don't have a business, you have a hobby. Into utilities. You're going to pay your cell phone. You want to put this number in as an annual number. So if you're paying your cell phone by the month, multiply that by 12. Same with water. If you're going to uh, pick up water and uh, dump your waste. It's disposal, if you're going to be paying for electric somewhere. And then other utilities. Whatever else you might need to put in there. Rents and fees and payments. So if you are uh, leasing a spot in front of uh, another business and they're charging you an amount, again, multiply the monthly number times 12. Event fees. If you're planning on going to big events, you need to know how much those fees are so you can have that money in your budget so that you're not scrambling to find $2,200 to attend an event. And I'm going to tell you right now that a lot of people, because of what happened last year, are freaking out about uh, events that are wanting to charge 10%, 20%, 30%, or if they want to charge, like in this case, $2,200. If they have a good track record of advertisement and attendance and a few other things, I have spreadsheets that will help you make that decision too. Paying $2,200 to make two, you know, 20000 over a weekend, would you do that? Would you gamble that? There are people that will not pay a 20% um, a fee, 20% of your sales fee, because they go, oh, it's too high. Why do you think stuff costs the way that it does when you go to an event? Because the vendors there, they understand math and they are accounting for those fees they've paid to attend the event and they're charging you for them. All they're doing is passing the fee on to you. So don't complain to them when they're charging you $350 for a bottle of water. Go talk to the event promoter and ask them why in the world are you charging these guys so much money that they have to charge me three fifty for a bottle of water. That's who you complain to, because the vendor is going to deserves to make money, and if they understand math, they're going to price their menu accordingly. So a twenty two hundred dollar fee for an event is not something to go. Oh no, we can't do that. Can't make no money. If it's a brand new event, uh, probably right. They shouldn't be even even charging for a brand new event. They should have a track record and demonstrate that they can bring in, you know, the 100,000 uh, attendance crowds. If they can't, don't spend any money with them. Let somebody else be the guinea pig. Commissary, you have to pay for a commissary. Multiply that out again, whether you do it hourly, monthly, or there are some commissaries that do an annual fee. Get that money in there. Storage, if you have to store your vehicle, this person is going to be storing their vehicle in a locked area where they have uh, power as well. But they had to pay for their own power. But at least it's under lock and key inside a uh, storage place with, they said, like an eight foot high fence and barbed wire and all that kind of stuff. If you take out a loan payment, 
Here's where you put the sum total of your loan payments. If you um, do a lease to own program, this is one of the things that people freak out about. So you can't make any money. You're just going to be paying for it. It costs so much. Well, yes, it does because you're borrowing somebody else's money. If you have bought a home, work out how much money you're paying the bank back on that 30-year mortgage. Your home may have cost $100,000, but you're paying way, way more than $100,000. But people don't freak out about that because it's a home. Well, here's a business where you can pay for that home. So don't worry about a loan payment. If you have to borrow money, borrow it. Get yourself open. Get yourself the education you need so you make some money and you're not having to default on the loan. But rent to own, lease to own, loans are not a bad thing. The bad thing is how you handle those loans and loan payments. And the bad thing is you're not understanding business when you sign on the dotted line. Banking fees, some banks charge you fees. Now, these are not credit card processing fees. This would be whatever banking fees or deposit bags. Some banks charge for deposit bags, that kind of thing. If you do subscriptions, like uh, your POS system has a monthly fee. Uh, if you do credit card processing that has a subscription, there's a number of those that do as well. If you do something like Microsoft Office or QuickBooks, uh, if you do a loyalty program, payroll, anything that's got a subscription that you have to pay that fee monthly, then put that there as well. If you do an equipment lease, uh, which is different than uh, a rent to own or lease to own. Lease to own means eventually you own whatever you're paying on. Equipment lease would be somebody that lives in one of the bigger cities that actually lease out trucks. Now, if you want to freak out at those, look at some of the uh, companies that lease fully equipped food trucks. They'll be over $3,000 a month. A lot of the ones in Los Angeles are leased. So think about that. They are paying $3,000 a month to not own something, and they're still making money and profit. So don't worry about a loan that costs you $1,200 a month. It's all in your vision and your ability to execute that vision. And then I got room for other payments. You can put depreciation there, whatever other numbers that, that make sense to be under the header of rents and fees and payments, put it there. There's room for you to make adjustments on this sheet so you can get everything you're going to be spending out accounted for in some way, shape, or form. And then finally, you get a grand total on your annual fixed cost. Now, you can see that the annual fixed cost right here is $133,635.81. $100,000 of that is the person's pay. So keep that in mind. Next thing you're going to do is work on your percentages the variable cost. These are impacted as you are open for business selling food. If you're closed today, obviously you're not selling food. So you're not consuming food, but you still have to pay for the cell phone, whether you're open or closed today. But you don't have to pay for inventory if you're closed because you're not selling anything. So I always tell everybody start at 25% food cost. That's where your goal should be as a sales mix. And what I mean by sales mix is you need to average 25% food cost. You may sell a burger with you know steak and a, two or three other kind of meats on it for a 35% food cost. That's okay if you offset it with a side item and a drink to help bring down that 35% down to around that 25% area. You know, we sell bottles of water and the food costs in those are about 11% or less. Depending upon what you charge, it may be as low as you know six, seven percent. So you have to balance. You have to balance your um, food cost and your food cost goals. So your goal is a twenty-five percent overall food cost. In my food cost presentation from a couple of uh, months ago, we talked about how to maintain the inventory, how to project sales so that you are only buying twenty-five percent. Uh, of what you project your sales to be. And then that 25% of purchases should be enough money to cover the sales that you have. Next thing we have is hourly labor. Hourly labor is a percentage because you can send somebody home early when you realize, oh, it's slow today. Why don't you go ahead and take off early? Most folks will jump at the chance to go home early. Or if you realize it's going to rain tomorrow morning and you just call them up and say, hey, we're suddenly going to be open tomorrow. 
again, it's a variable percent. Or you're going to tell them, you just take off tomorrow, I'm going to do it by myself. Again, a variable percentage. So they have an 18% uh, variable percentage goal for their hourly labor. The payroll taxes, and these will vary wildly from state to state. Some states charge a straight percentage. Some charge a really convoluted uh, portion of a dollar per hour per employee that, that works. There's a lot of different ways to, to compute the different payroll taxes. You just want to establish whatever that uh, percentage is. If you run hourly labor, include your taxes in there as well. Not your personal taxes, but your um, your workers' comp, workers' um, unemployment, those kind of payroll taxes. If you are doing just straight labor as far as a salary goes, then put those numbers up in the other section because it's a fixed amount. Because you pay a salary whether you're open or closed. So keep that in mind. So you're going to put that percentage in. All right, next we have uh, r &M is repair and maintenance for the tow vehicle, the trailer maintenance, and then any equipment repair and maintenance. These are budget amounts. This is going to be money you're going to set aside. So you're going to assume at some point in the coming year, your equipment is going to break down in some way, shape, or form, or you're going to perform routine maintenance on it, like oil changes and, and greasing the, the wheels and that type of thing. So you're going to set that money aside, but you have to have a budget in mind. So what I suggest is a 1% for the tow vehicle, 50% uh, or not 50%, 0.5% on um, the trailer maintenance itself, which would be the, the physical trailer, and then set aside 0.75 for the equipment. And then that money gets set aside. So every day you're, you have sales, you're going to have an account where that is just for R&M, and, and then also you'll have it for um, marketing, as you'll see in just a minute. Hopefully you don't have to use this for a couple of months, and then when you have that emergency where you do have to use it, you've already got money set aside. I can't tell you how many people will have zero money set aside, knowing full well that their truck is going to break down at some point. You cannot get around it. And do not be tempted to spend that money. It's there for repair and maintenance. All right, let's move on to cleaning supplies. This is a uh, budget that you want to think about in advance. So you may be buying this stuff as the month progresses. I used to buy it all at, all at once. I would project my sales for the month if I was going to do... Uh, you know, $100,000 in sales, then I translated that 4% into a dollar amount. So this is all I'm going to spend. And we as a team have to make this stuff last. And once you do that, your team gets really, really good about not wasting soap, about not wasting the scrub pads because they got a little bit of dirt on them, about not, um, you know, tossing out your uh, disposable towels or wasting paper towels or anything like that. So cleaning supplies have a budget. Same with office supplies. Now you're thinking, why well, I have a food truck. Why do I have office supplies? You know, I don't print um, you know, a lot of receipts on a PC. That's true, but you do in all likelihood probably have some type of print, receipt printer. And you want to have that money available for that. And there's other things you could do, you know, pencils and pens and markers. And and uh, if you use a, a label maker, those are all office supplies. You know, some people use a price gun or a date gun. So the little stickers that go in there when they date their food products, day dots, if you use the day dot system, office supplies. Because it's not food, it's not paper, but it's office supplies. And then you got room for more things that are going to be variable, either things you want to budget and set that money aside or things that, that your business will consume on a monthly basis that you want to make sure you have covered by some type of budgetary constraint. Dave Ramsey recommends you spend all your money ahead of the month. So when you get into the month, you know how much goes towards groceries and electric and, and so on. 
Same with a business. You want to pre-spend all your money, either dollar-wise or percentage-wise, based on your sales, so that you don't go out and say, well, I need $2,000 worth of cleaning supplies. I need a new mop bucket. I need a new ringer. I need... You know, I need six brooms and, and two dustpans, and I need the fancy shiny dustpan to go out and sweep the parking lot with. Those things cost money. And if you don't have a budget, you will overspend on those things. And a marketing budget, 3%. Set aside 3% of your sales because you're going to market in some way, shape, or form. If you're not, your business is going to fail. You cannot depend on social media. You can't take that assumption of if I build a fruit food truck and park it, people will come to it. No, they won't. If you park a food truck with no marketing done anywhere else, the only possible people that you will get are people that can see it. And I've seen how some of you folks set up. You make your truck as hidden or your trailer, especially as hidden as possible. You'll have a white trailer and park it in front of a white building. And then the trailer just blends into the building. So no one can see it. No one notices it. Marketing would include things like feather signs and marquee lighting, um, yard signs, anything that's going to draw somebody's attention to your building. It could be flyers. It could technically it could even be coupons if you want to run coupon amounts. You could have that fall into a marketing budget. Then you're going to have a total percentage that we talked about, and that will be subtracted from the 100. And then it'll get divided by that $133,000 we had at the top. Sheet does that for you. So after you have completed the expense questions, you're going to move to the break-even points. It will give you a cash-only break-even point, and it will give you a credit card break-even point based on whatever you input into the system for your credit card percentage and your average checks. And you'll notice this breaks it down annually, monthly, weekly, and daily. So this person, remember they're paying themselves $100,000. They need to do $98.79. And they will be able to pay themselves $100,000 a year but they have to do that nearly $2,000 every day they're open. So what happens if they're not open? Then obviously they've got to make $4,000 the next day they're open or split that out over the next several days. If they don't hit that goal, then they know they have to make up for it the next day. That's why you have to know how much money it costs you to get out into the, uh, into the world and start selling. So in this particular case, my friend is going to fire his truck up and he needs to go out and make nearly $2,000 a day in sales. And you break that down into guest count. That's the number right below it. He needs to have 111 guests a day at that $18 check average to be able to, to have that $2,000 sales goal. And then to also, again, pay himself a $100,000 salary. The total amount there is just slightly, I'm going to say that again, just slightly higher than the average food truck. The official average sales of a food truck. There are a number of food trucks that make um, well over $300,000 a year generate that in sales well over and there is just as many probably more that don't ever break a hundred thousand but if you want to get out and pay yourself whatever you want to put in that salary uh, section put it in there and then you know exactly how many sales you got to make and how many people it takes to make those sales so in this example, we all know 111 people. I would dare say that most of the people watching this video have that many friends on their Facebook. And if you have that many friends, each of them have friends too. So just your personal reach, you, you probably have well over a thousand or more people in your personal reach between your friends, your family, and their friends and family.
so you can get your name out there if you choose to do it. It's just a lot of people a little bit timid and they don't want to put it on their personal page. I don't want people to know I start my own food truck because they look down on food truck. And this is not a really a, a well-respected business. Well, back when I was a full-time restaurant manager, you know, the big joke was if you're a restaurant manager, the only thing you really know how to do is to ask people if they want fries with their sandwich. Because really, that's, that's all that uh, suggested selling is. And that's all a lot of people just think. All we do is ring up stuff and say, would you like fries with that? And then move on to the next customer. But if you're really, really good at what you do, and you actually take the time to learn the systems and learn how to improve yourself and then improve your staff, you'll have opportunities presented to you that are amazing. For me, I got to go to the Virgin Islands and run a Wendy's down there for a year. All because I was a really, really good Wendy's restaurant manager. And the reputation preceded me. So when I went to the interview, I was interviewing just to be able to move to the Virgin Islands. I didn't want to run a restaurant for them. I just wanted to be their assistant manager and have no responsibility. But because my reputation preceded me. They called me back in one week, hired me, and gave me the biggest salary I'd ever had in my entire life to that point. They paid for me to live in the Virgin Islands. I lived in St. Thomas. They paid for me to have a truck to drive around on uh, St. Thomas and still had two days off a week, 14 hours a day, and it was a piece of cake because I had 12 managers under me and 90 employees. All I had to do was make sure they did their job right. And I got to do all of that stuff that other people n never get to do just because I was really good at asking people, do you want fries with that? So be proud of what you do. Be very proud of what you do. And then take it serious and make a whole bunch of money. So let's look on the sheet a little bit more. The details that we have here. Uh, the cash only, so if you want to break it down, it tells you exactly every expense you have, what it's going to cost you per day, per week, per month, per year. So it breaks it down to a little miniature profit and loss statement. Same with this one. This one is based on the credit cards. So if you're doing cash only, you're on this one. If you're doing credit cards, you're on this one. Same deal. Breaks it all down and you know exactly how much money you've got to make before you ever pull that piece back out.